All right, my friends. How are y'all doing this evening? It's good to see you. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't actually done a Consider This in, in quite a while. And so I'm excited that we get to be together and especially to discuss what we're talking about tonight uh, because it is important. Uh, now, if you haven't done this with us before, there's kind of a way that we do this. It's interactive. So this is Johnny Buckles. And Johnny is a professor of law at the University of Houston uh, School of Law. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, Roe v. Wade, and specifically, it's recently being, having been overturned. Uh, so most of our focus tonight, just so you know, is, is a little bit less on the morality. It's more on the, what just happened here, right? And the overturning of the decision going back to 1973. Now, if you're new to consider this, first, welcome, whether you're physically here in the room or if your moderator will see the questions that are coming in and will pass those forward to me, okay? Now, once the moderator passes the questions forward, you'll be able to see them. Initially, they're private, but then after they're passed forward, you'll get to see them. And maybe you look at a question and you go, that's a really good question. Here's what I need you to do. Like it. Because the more likes a question gets, the more of a priority it gets in terms of which questions we ask tonight versus which ones we don't because we never actually get to all of them because we just run out of time. So it doesn't mean if we don't get to your question that you had a bad question. It might just mean we ran out of time, okay? So if you got your phone, you got to minty.com, you've got the code in, you're ready to go. So as far as the Q&A is concerned, we're leaving it up to you. And even if you're with us on the live stream, you can do the same. You don't physically have to be here to ask a question. And so we're inviting you to be a part of it as well, okay? All right, now with that all said, let me introduce myself. My name is Jeremy Evans. I'm the pastor here at Woodridge. I've already mentioned Johnny Buckles. He's a member here of our church. And when the decision uh, came out a couple of weeks ago, I reached out to him and I said, you know, I would love for us to have a couple of months of preparation, but, but we don't. Uh, <laughs> because we will have missed the moment. Uh, so I'd ask Johnny, hey, if, would you be willing to come in here and to talk? Because I don't know if you paid any attention to social media, uh, but it is, it is all over the place as to what happened when the Supreme Court overturned the decision going back to 1973. What we really want to do tonight is to talk about what, what that means. What did the court actually do in revoking the decision? the expert on this and so I'm going to give him a lot of time so I, I get to actually get us going does that sound good I'm going to start with with the question by the way it's really relaxed in here tonight maybe not so much on social media I noticed when we said we were talking about this uh, it got a little amped up and that was to be expected people on each side of this issue are pretty passionate about it but before we begin I want to point something out did you know this we have coffee right over here and it's free. All you got to do is drink it. And we have cookies and refreshments. And so this is a really relaxed format. Uh, we want you, to, we want you to, to have a chance to ask and, and get your questions answered. Uh, but we also want you to have some refreshments if that's something that you would benefit from as well. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. All right. So Johnny, here's the thing. Uh, I want you to talk to us just a little bit and, and kind of keeping it, you know, big picture. I understand that we could get really, really nuanced on things, but keeping it to the big picture, just a couple of things. One is, so how, how did we even get to the road decision like, to begin with? You know, what were, what were the basic arguments that you saw in 1973 when, when the road decision came out that uh, set the stage for what we're having to discuss right now. So I just, I, I just wanted you to take some time and to speak to that. All right, well, Roe v. Wade, uh, in, in some ways... Did I turn it on? Just it's on. Okay. Roe v. Wade, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, on the specific issue, there we go, uh, came out of the blue, <laughs> but, but there were some precedents leading up to Roe v. Wade that set the stage for it. So there, there had been state Supreme Court in, in matters um, involving contraception, for example, uh, where the, the court was looking at uh, privacy rights. 
Now, if you read the text of the Constitution, including the amendments, you, you don't see any right to privacy. Um, but over the course of time, the, the court was recognizing some rights that it, it tied to privacy as, as being um, implied uh, part of the edges, if you will, of some other enumerated constitutional rights. So uh, by the time that uh, the, the Texas law in Roe v. Wade was, was challenged, although there was no Supreme Court precedent whatsoever on the constitutional right to an abortion. Uh, there were some decisions in, involving matters of personal autonomy, um, choice, that sort of thing, uh, that, that sounded in the language of privacy. Uh, and so the stage was set to test uh, whether the court would recognize a, a right to abortion on, on the basis of those precedents. So when it came to the road decision, what we're kind of, and again, we're keeping it to, to the big picture, but um, when it came to the road decision, what were the, the primary things that they were focusing on that would, would ground? Because initially, you know, people would say, well, it, it, you could say if the, the woman's life is in danger, but doctors, it seemed, already had the, 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 the capability of advocating for a woman before Roe. What's been brought up is that since Roe, there was an expansion of, of, um, of rights where um, when it came to the woman, it could factor in maybe her life was in danger, but it went well beyond that, psychological considerations among other things. So, so when it comes to, to the Roe decision itself, what would you say, like if you talk about just checkpoints, what was the big picture as to why a woman's right was almost considered absolute throughout the course of the, the pregnancy? Well, I think that the the reasoning uh, of the court itself was heavily influential in the way society responded to uh, the question of, of abortion. Um, so, so you need to kind of, you mentioned the tracing of how we, we right. got here. Uh, let's back up just a bit okay. to, to understand uh, how much changed, all right? Uh, so by the time that the 14th Amendment was enacted, the states uh, throughout the United States, three quarters of the states criminalized abortion. Criminalized. And just a reminder, the 14th Amendment is? Okay. The 14th Amendment is, uh, was enacted uh, to prohibit any state from depriving any person of, of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Okay. Okay? Um, so Roe mentioned this privacy right as inhering in the liberty concept. You can't deprive someone of, of liberty, like liberty or property without due process of law. It, it had this substantive notion of what liberty means. Uh, it, it saw privacy as part of that, okay, and, and therefore saw the right to abortion as part of that. But, but what I'm saying is that was very different from the lay of the legal land, even at the time that the Supreme Court handed the decision down, and certainly very different from the time that the 14th Amendment was enacted, notwithstanding that the 14th Amendment was a tie to really hinge the case, right? Um, so when it was enacted, three quarters of the states uh, criminalized uh, abortion. Now, that had been relaxed somewhat by the time uh, that Roe was decided, um, but you still had a majority of the states uh, that prohibited it un under criminal penalty. Uh, and furthermore, uh, until very near the time that Roe was, was decided, no courts had even recognized uh, a right to abortion. So this was a, a groundbreaking decision, even when you think about how the law was developing up until that time. After Roe was decided, uh, the court had occasion to consider uh, the response of the states because the states, many of the states that in, in general were uh, against uh, abortion but knew that they couldn't criminalize it, would try to uh, 
limit abortions through the back door, through various ways of, of regulating abortion. Um, and a number of those more procedural aspects of regulating abortion were struck down as well. So what you have is Roe being reinforced for a time and way. That really was true until 1992. In 1992, the Supreme Court decided Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Now, how many of you thought that prior to Dobbs, Roe was the law of the land on abortion? If you thought that, just raise your hand. Yeah, most people would have thought that. If most of you were not being bashful, you probably would have raised your hand. But it really wasn't, strictly speaking, true. Roe was not the law of the land, not in its original form. It was Roe as modified by subsequent decisions, the most important of which is uh, the Casey case, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. It rejected the trimester framework. So Roe has this you know, elaborate scheme where in, in the first trimester, the state can't regulate abortion at all. In the second trimester, it can regulate if that's necessary to protect the, the health of the mother, but cannot in any way prevent uh, the exercise of, of the right to abortion until uh, roughly the third trimester, roughly the point of viability. What Casey did was to expressly reject the trimester framework, okay? Uh, and what Casey did was say, well, there cannot be um, a, an undue burden on the exercise of the abortion right prior to viability. And so it, it did seize on viability like Roe did, okay? And so I think this is responsive to your question because Casey reinforced this notion of the abortion right um, existing until the point of fetal viability. So that became part of our jurisprudence for a very long time, even though the trimester framework was not respected by Casey. Casey reinforced Roe by affirming the viability concept, even characterizing it as the central concept. Now, it chipped away at Roe because some of the regulations that were deemed unconstitutional in the years immediately following Roe were now deemed constitutional. Casey was uh, more cognizant, more respectful of uh, the, the state's interest in promoting a decision uh, for fetal life. So the state couldn't unduly burden a decision to abort the fetus, incentivize continuing to keep the fetus uh, in the womb as long as that was not an undue burden on, on the right. So I believe that the, the, the answer to your question is that the Supreme Court itself um, tended to establish and accelerate um, society's views or, or acceptance of uh, the exercise of an abortion right up to the point of viability. Which is the ability of the child to live outside, outside the womb. of the womb. That's right. Yeah, okay. So you have the Dobbs case coming out of Mississippi, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then the Supreme Court uh, hears that and flips functionally. So what happened? <laughs> what, so what, 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 was the, what was the big idea <laughs> to look back? Did you like how he laughed at my question? <laughs> it's a fair question. You know. so, so what happened? If you're taking a look at a decision that, you know, because if you pay attention to what people are saying, you're overturning, you know, law that's been, you know, around for 50 years now. Uh, and, and what you're seeing at least mentioned, I don't know that it's an argument, but it, it's mentioned is, you know, that shouldn't be in the purview of the court to be, to, be, to be doing something like that. But so what was the rationale of the court to say the Roe decision wasn't a good decision and then to send it back to the states, which is what the Dobbs decision did, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep, so what right. was the big picture? What were they? Two major moves. Okay, uh, first move. Roe is horribly reasoned. Uh, trimester framework pulled out of thin air without grounding in history, tradition, uh, or precedent. 
Step two, applying normal principles of stare decisis. Uh, now you know I'm going to have you define that. <laughs> yeah, it's a Latin uh, phrase, right. which means to stand by things decided. In law, it means uh, you follow prior cases. So it's very strictly applied to lower courts. Like if the Supreme Court hands down a decision, lower courts have to follow that, right? Well, what, what about uh, decisions of the same court? So for the Supreme Court, this principle of let the decision stand, stare decisis, uh, it's a standard, not a bright line rule. There are many, many cases that you would recognize today uh, that represent a decision to abandon stare decisis. I mean, how many of you think that the Constitution, for example, uh, ensures that the state cannot segregate on the basis of race? I think we would all raise our hands. Well, that's because of Brown v. Board. But it overruled Plessy v. Ferguson, a decision that had been on the books longer right. than Roe v. Wade. So those are the two major steps, but I, I need to unpack at least the first step right. some to answer your question really in any meaningful way. Why is it that the court decided Roe v. Wade was decided so wrongly? Well, what the court said is that when the Constitution itself does not speak explicitly to a right, then uh, what you have to do to determine whether there uh, is a due process right with respect to whatever it is, is in quest question is that it must be deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. liberty. All right? Now, I have that in my notes. I'll repeat it again. This is the standard. Deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And so the court asked, is that true of the right that Roe v. Wade said is a constitutional right? So it went on a pretty deep dive on what the tradition in this country was prior to the decision in Roe v. Wade concerning abortion. No state had ever recognized a right to abortion. And indeed, quite the contrary, uh, as I said, at the time of the adoption of the 14th Amendment, three quarters of the states actually criminalized it under the common law. The court went back to the common law because, because our laws before statutory enactments were based largely on the common law that we inherited from England. Uh, and abortion, at least after the point of, you know, this is an ancient concept, but of quickening. Basically, if, if, if the mom could feel the baby kick or move or something, that was, that was thought of as quickening, at least, at least, after that point, under the common law, it was criminal. Of course, even if it hadn't been criminal, that doesn't mean that the right would be rooted, right? Because you may very well not be criminally punished for doing something, but that doesn't mean that something is a constitutional right, right? right. Just because something isn't criminal doesn't mean you have a right to do it. The, the question is the authority of the state, right? And so the court not only found the criminalization of abortion, uh, uh, up until the time uh, of the, the adoption of the 14th Amendment and beyond, but also uh, pointed out that there was an affirmative right to abortion that was recognized at the time, um, and, and indeed was not widely recognized even at the time of the deciding uh, Roe v. Wade. So then what the court did was say, okay, uh, it's not deeply rooted in our history and tradition, uh, but there are some in our precedent decided were fundamental and, and inherent in this concept of ordered liberty. So is it, is it one of those? So the court said no. Um, so what was it getting at? Well, m matters of like uh, sexual intimacy, uh, contraception, uh, who to choose as, as your spouse, okay, those kinds of decisions that have been recognized as uh, fundamental. And what the court said is none of those are controlling here because in none of those cases did the state have a competing interest of preserving what Roe v. Wade would call potential life, what the Mississippi statute that was an issue in the Dobbs case uh, recognized as an unborn child. That was the difference. So. 
So what I just elaborated on was really just step one <laughs> of the analysis, which was, if you want to reduce it down, Roe was terribly decided because it had no basis in precedent, history, or a tradition, just was created out of thin air. And then the second point, then, employing multiple factors, we don't have to obey our bad decision under the principle of stare decisis. That's how the court got there. So once it decided that it did not have to obey under principles of stare decisis, now when I say obey, I'm really meaning defer, right. defer to a prior precedent, the court said, well, since this is not a, a, a true constitutional right, uh, shouldn't be viewed that way, the Mississippi law only has to satisfy rational basis review. That's, that's a low standard of, of constitutional review. As long as the state has some reasonable basis, just say, hands off, um, the state can do what it wants. So that's how it got there. Got it. So um, I'll ask you one more. I, I haven't even taken a look yet, but have, have, you need to be asking some getting your questions ready. All right, are you all ready? Because I'm about to, to come to you people and see what it is that you want to ask. But um, so what the decision did, if I understand it correctly, is take it from the federal level and put it back to okay, and put it back to yeah. the states, yeah. right? Yeah. So so some of the some of the concerns, or some of the th things I see people pointing out is, well, you know, what you have in Texas is very different from what you're going to be seeing in, for example, California. Yeah. And that would be true. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or even Tennessee, because Tennessee has already spoken spoken about the matter. And so, how does something like that? How does something like that even work? When you when you re, when you when you relegate something back to the states, how does that how does that work? It's the state political process. Uh, so the way that the court viewed the issue is, we're just returning this to the states that Roe v. Wade wrongly took it upon the Supreme Court to decide these matters, um, and the Supreme Court should not be deciding these matters. Instead, it should be done through democratic processes. Uh, we don't have federal legislation on the, the general question now. Of course, we haven't needed to because <laughs> of, right. of Casey and, and, and Roe, right? Um, so the court's view is that, look, uh, nine people in black robes should not be deciding these questions that, that involve a balancing of the burdens of on a woman and the, the interest uh, in promoting the, the continued development uh, of the developing fetus. It's not our job, the court said. It's, it's the job of democracy. And so, well, the way it looks is democratic processes in each state. So you are correct. Maybe I should answer your question in part by saying what the court did not decide, right? right? right. Okay. Right. So first thing, the court did not decide. The court did not prevent abortions, plain and simple. It leaves the regulation of abortion to the political process at the state level. So states decide what to do. Second thing that I think you need to understand about this decision and what it did not do. The decision does not right, recognize a right to fetal life. It does not pronounce the fetus an unborn human being, a person. It, it does not speak at all to the personhood of the unborn. Now, that's pretty important um, because what it means is that these policy decisions are going to now be made not by the court, but in the political process at the state level unless Congress tries to do something. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's, that's important to uh, observe, although you can question the general tone of the opinion, as many have done, the decision does not address directly other constitutional rights, like marriage issues. Um, this was a very contentious point in both the briefs before the Supreme Court and in the dissenting opinions of Justice Beyer, who was joined by uh, Justices Sotomayor and Kagan. Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas, um, he wrote an opinion where he said, we need to relook at a lot of these rights. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, the court itself, though, took great pains to say, this is unique <laughs> because it involves what Roe recognized as potential life, what 
the Mississippi statute recognizes as an unborn person, unborn human being. Um, and so what we're, what we're left with is a lack of clarity on how other constitutional rights will be uh, affected, notwithstanding the majority's insistence that it wasn't uh, addressing that. And then the other thing that the majority opinion doesn't address, that we probably ought to put out on the table, uh, it really didn't speak to whether certain highly restrictive laws on abortion would be held constitutional. So you should know that the Mississippi statute, it, it prohibited abortions at uh, much earlier in the gestational age than viability, at 15 weeks, but it did allow exceptions. It allowed exceptions for uh, maternal health. It allowed uh, an exception for severe abnormality uh, of the fetus. Now those, you know, are manipulable uh, depending on who's making decisions on that. But all I'm saying is that law did have exceptions. Now, of course, the, the Texas law that was struck down in Roe exception for protecting the life of the mother too. But what I'm saying is the opinion itself doesn't address, you know, how far really um, states can go in, in making it very difficult. Um, that's going to be left to another day, I think, uh, clearly. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, in his concurring opinion, did throw out uh, a very strong hint that he would look with suspicion on anything that was uh, unreasonably restrictive in terms of mobility. So like Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh said, you know, my personal view is if a state tried to prevent a woman from going to another state, California right. or New York, right. um, that that would raise serious constitutional questions. I mean, he speculated that would not be constitutional. So we're, we're gonna have to see how that goes too and how the states respond to this decision. Of course, there are a lot of other interesting ways that states could respond too, sure. including those in pro-life mm -hmm. states. Right, right. Uh, you know, I, I said I only had one last question and I was getting to you and I didn't tell you the truth because I have another one now. Uh, I think this one might be quick though. Uh, you, you know, I'm hearing it said, you know, this is basically just a way for somebody to force their religion down our throat. Um, is that really what happened in the overturning of Roe? No, I don't, I, I don't think so. I think it's a, a very different uh, uh, view of the Constitution is what was going on in, in Roe uh, that really could have long-standing, wide-reaching implications. I mean, that's, that's what a number of, of, uh, of critics of the Dobbs case are saying. Uh, like there's a, there's a there's a professor at Harvard that said I now think that I need to think of my academic career in sort of like BC AD terms with <laughs> with Dobbs being right. you know the defining moment in history right. as though every president before Dobbs you know was understood under under one constitutional framework and everything after Dobbs will be decided under another constitutional framework I, I think that's it's, it's, it's broader than uh, isolating religious views. It, it's a theory of constitutional interpretation. Now, having said that, do I believe that notions of recognizing at least the possibility that there is personhood uh, in utero, mm -hmm. uh, a possibility that would be left to the political process to decide, do I think that that was present, obviously so. And is it possible that some kind of religious-based morality informed the worldview of some of those justices? I would say yes, and I would further say, and that is always the case, that, that we have worldviews that are shaped by all kinds of considerations. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think that murder is wrong, ask yourself why, uh, right? right. Um, and it, I would think that for many in this room, at least part of the reasons that you believe murder is wrong is because of a, a religious framework, a religious-based morality. Um, so do I think that, you know, big, broad, deep moral worldviews have some bearing on the way that people address certain subsidy issue, subsidiary issues? I think the answer is yes, that's inevitable. And I don't think you could have a, a coherent structure of anything 
if you didn't recognize that people's overall value systems bear some you know, relationship to whatever system we're talking about, whether it's a legal system or some other kind of system. But do I think it is uh, a kind of consciously designed effort to impose a particular re religious view? I think that would be a completely unfair Too far. character. Well, yes, just, just as I would say it would be unfair to characterize the Roe decision as based on a religiously antagonistic view. I think a different idea probably was held by a majority of the justices that decided bro, but that doesn't mean that it should be thought of as a, as a primarily religious decision. I mean, there, were, there are implications and foundations that involve religious-based morality in all kinds of contexts, and uh, I would just say this is really no different than that. Yeah, which is basically the way like, Robert George up at Princeton says there's nobody that comes from nowhere. Right. Right. Uh, and so that would go, if, you know, if you say something is true about a, a Christian, there maybe there's a Christian bias. Well, that would actually be true of anybody. Everybody, yeah. everybody has bias, right? Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and sometimes we, we, I would say it's often the case that people from different religious perspectives still have common values, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and so there, there are many who would say, oh, yeah, I value human life. And, and then the question is, okay, uh, how much, uh, what's your criteria for the value? Uh, who do you call, who counts right. as human life, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there, are, there are value systems where, you know, both the religious and the non-religious have something in common. And it's not the case, for example, that all religious people, even all Christian people, even all evangelical people, even all Baptist evangelical people, <laughs> are going to have exactly the same notion. No, actually not. And after, after Roe was overturned, there was even, I'm trying to remember which, which group it was out of Houston, was trying to, to gather their churches together for an evening of lament over the overturning of Roe. Uh, so, and that, that was a gathering of churches uh, that was set to do that, not, not a gathering of, of unbelievers, for example. Right. And, and to your point, there are even groups of atheists that, were, uh, that have identified as as pro-life, yes. albeit for different reasons. Yes. So it just goes to your point. Yeah. Now there's a question here, uh, question number one and two, and they go hand in hand. So I'll begin with the, the first one. It says, what was Biden's executive order? And oh, what does it mean? You know, I saw the headline, I haven't even read it, but I, I think it, it probably doesn't do a whole lot. Uh, I, would have to, <laughs> I would have to study exactly what the executive order is. But uh, I mean, I thought from the headline I saw that it was basically trying to facilitate, uh, to the extent the federal government could facilitate or not get in the way uh, of a decision to exercise the right in the states that still provide for it, that that will be done. But, but I, I don't know anything beyond that. OK, yeah. OK. So the second question was, does the president, by executive order or Congress, have the authority to force states to allow abortion? No, Biden can't make the law right. uh, uh, that would apply in this context. Congress, I think Congress could. Uh, see, this, this is why it's important to remember what I said about what the court did not do. The court did not decide that a fetus has any rights whatsoever. It just didn't. It left it to the states. But the reason, as I said, it left it to the states is Congress hasn't spoken to the issue. Now, sometimes Congress does speak to the abortion issue. Um, remember the, I don't know, a few years back, several years back now, uh, controversy surrounding uh, partial, partial birth abortions, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, Congress spoke to that issue. Right? So could Congress speak to that issue? Yes, Congress could legislate on the issue, as far as this opinion goes, okay? as far as the Dobbs opinion goes. There is nothing in the Dobbs opinion that would keep Congress from either trying to uh, expand access to abortion or uh, to restrict access to abortion. Now, the court wasn't deciding any limits on that, so it's important to remember that. But as far as the Dobbs decision itself goes, there's not any limitation on the ability of Congress to act. 
Now, uh, Biden can't make law. Uh, no president can make law in the same sense that Congress can make law. Right. We think of executive orders sometimes as, as, as law, but they're laws within contexts like funding, right? So if you want to get government money, then you've got to do X, Y, and Z, right? Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so where the executive has discretion in those matters, uh, hiring of personnel, for example, uh, allowing federal employees to have access to abortion, that kind of thing. Uh, right, the president can, can do that. But the president does not have the authority to tell states that <laughs> they cannot restrict mm. uh, abortions. Okay. I'm afraid this one might end up falling on me somehow. But here was the question. How should the church handle church leaders who support abortion? I'll let you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> How should the church handle How church? should the church handle church leaders who support abortion? Yeah, I think you should lead. I, I, I have views. I, okay. have, I do have views, but I think you should lead on this because it's a, what should the church do? And you're the pastor of a church. I knew he was going to do that. I mean, I, I, I am a humble <laughs> law it. professor that, that teaches a modest size <laughs> Sunday school class and have a happy little family. I mean, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is for you to lead with. Okay. All right. I'll do it. Um, now, look, I, 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 want, I want to be sensitive to this because there are, there are, circum, there are circumstances that, you know, as, as a pastor that I've had to help people think through. One, we need to understand that the overwhelming majority of abortions are elective abortions. So we're not talking about is the mother's life in danger we're not talking about cases like rape and incest, which I think is still less than 1% of, of any of the cases, if I've got that right. Uh, we're, we're talking about something different. Uh, you know, the, it's usually a crisis pregnancy. The woman isn't sure uh, what to do. The father of the child is not coming alongside. Maybe the family is not supported. There, there are a whole range of things that could be factored in here. Okay, so th you know, that, that being said, have there been times where I've had to meet with people where they are dealing with an extraordinary circumstance? Where, for example, maybe the, the mom is found to be pregnant and then after being found to be pregnant is also found to have cancer. And the answer is yes. I've had to sit down with people that are making those kinds of choices. How do you think about that? Well, you know, typically one of the reasons that we would talk about the being precious and beautiful is that that life in the womb is created in the image of God. And I would agree with that. The mom is also created in the image of God. See, this is the way that intrinsic value works. You just have it. it, it it's not like if you're 34 years old, you've got less intrinsic value or a, a child that is, is eight months gestational has more intrinsic. Intrinsic value is just intrinsic value. They both have it. And so making an appeal to intrinsic value when a husband and a wife are trying to make a decision like that, I haven't found that to be terribly helpful. So what would they do? I mean, to receive treatment uh, means that they're not going to be able to go forward with, with the pregnancy, but to not receive treatment in some cases that I've met with, with couples means that there's an inevitable death that's waiting for the mom. And so you're sitting there with this tension. One is to advocate for a mom whose life is intrinsically valuable, but also at the same time saying, I, I don't know that we can have it both ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, but I'm, I'm not going to let you out of the hot seat yet. So you've had me in the hot seat for a long I'll, time. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm, uh, look I'm, at this guy. I, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a law professor. I live, I, in, I live in hypotheticals. I know. And, and so I'm going to interpret by illustrating a hypothetical, because I think this is what the question was getting at. Okay. I, I like what you said. I appreciate what you said. I appreciate that perspective. It's an important um, uh, way to understand the contexts that, that yeah. the issues come in. So it's a, it's a good answer, but I think there's, a, there's another question in there. So in, in the form of a hypothetical. Is this your way of asking me a question that you want to ask? No, I, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm to be an advocate for the question asker okay. in the form of a hypothetical. Okay, go for it. Because the, the, the question was church leaders. Yeah. 
right? So you, you, you have, you have, stop treating him like a student, I'm so rude. Um, you have a staff member or a Sunday school teacher who is counseling and teaching people that there's nothing immoral about abortion. That's the hypothetical. Right. Now, uh, I would just suggest that uh, a pastor probably should have a conversation at least. Yes. With a person like that. Um, what would your conversation be like? So the reason that I was giving, look at this guy. So the reason that I was, I was giving the, the, the answer that I was giving was not to avoid the question, but to say that there can be a lot of nuance with this. And especially with the way that particularly evangelicals are caricatured on social media, which is usually not very kind, <laughs> we're treated as if we don't know how to do nuance very well. And I'm like, well, you know what? I've been in a lot of hospitals with a lot of people. There's a lot of nuance there. That's why I was starting the way that I was starting. You know, if you're talking about a, a woman that is dealing more with a crisis pregnancy, and they're saying, I, I, don't know what, I don't know what to do. Her life is totally fine. We're not dealing with cancer or anything like that. The answer that she should hear, so hear what I'm saying, the answer that she should hear from me or someone that is on the staff of this church or leadership of a church is, we will come alongside you in this. There's no reason for you to feel panicked or that you don't have the support that you're needed, that, that, you, that you need to make the decision that I think you want to make. I mean, the overwhelming majority of women, when they are polled, when they ask this question, if you're just given the choice whatsoever, what would you want? Most of them say, I don't want to end the pregnancy, but I don't know what to do. So that's where I think leaders in the church can come alongside as well as churches and we can put our money, we can put our time and we can where our mouth is at. That if we really value this child, we will come alongside you to see this is through. See, I think you just put your finger on a really important point and that is the question may assume only one side of the coin. The question may assume only a good answer on whether personhood and human life and being made in the image of God begins in the womb. Mm -hmm. But there's more to answer that question sure. fully as you've just identified. And that is, what does pro-life really mean? Right, it's not just pro-birth, it's not that. And just like, so, so I, I, I do hope that I'm answering, I do hope I'm answering the, the question. Uh, I, I do try to take, anytime, like when I taught ethics at A&M and, and we would get in, at Texas A&M, and we would get into some really difficult stuff. One of the things I always told the students is in order to make an informed decision, you need information. If you don't have information, it's very unlikely you're gonna make a good decision. You should be asking yourself, what do I not know? Go get the, as much information as you can possibly get. And that's why I try to be very mindful of what is the situation here? Does that make sense? What is going on here? So if I've got a woman here saying I'm pregnant, I also have cancer and I can't do both. That's a unique situation. It's statistically rare, but it still does happen. I wanna take her situation very seriously. And them advocating for the life of the mom means that they're advocating for someone that's intrinsically valuable. Yeah. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah, which is different than, as a, as a matter of, of of pure practicality, if I if we if we choose, I don't know how I'm going to finish my education. I don't know how I'm gonna, the Stevie the Stevie Nicks. Y'all know uh, Fleetwood Mac. You know when when Roe was overturned, Stevie Nicks, the lead singer in Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac, they said that she had been pregnant, and had she not aborted the child, the Rumors album wouldn't have come out. So she found that to be a morally sufficient reason for the termination of the pregnancy. Or actresses that were celebrating abortions at, at the Academy Awards and saying, I wouldn't be here to receive this award had I not gotten an abortion. I'm just going to throw this out there. I don't find that to be a morally sufficient reason to terminate a life of a child. I just don't. Um, and so, uh, all the while saying, there are circumstances that do require careful consideration and nuance. So I am more than pro-birth. I am pro-life through. That said, I was in a conversation with a more liberal friend of mine. Um, he was certainly more liberal than I am. And in the conversation a couple weeks ago when everything was overturned, I said, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would describe you as pro-choice. He goes, well, of course I am. I was like, no, I don't think you are. I think you're pro-abortion and there is a difference. Why, why haven't you ever walked up to a woman and said, let, let me begin this way. What do you want? 
And what if she says, I want to have this child. I just don't know if I have the financial means and, and whatnot to have this child. And what if your answer was to empower you in the choice that you're trying to make here, we're going to come alongside you so that that can come about. And I basically heard crickets chirp. See, that seems to me to be more of a connection. Put, put the, the other side of the choice aside. That seems to be more empowering a woman to make a choice than just saying, here's the empowering. And the empowering is you can have an abortion. Does that make any sense whatsoever? It makes a lot of sense. Thanks okay. a lot, Jeremy. I know, I know I'm having fun with Jeremy, but I actually yeah, pretty much totally knew what he was already up here. Probably I, I already knew what he was going to say. We had lunch recently. Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah. I, so, so there's that. So, so at, at the end of the day, here's the way. And, and let me speak to me for a second. Here's the way I look at it. I will ultimately be given, unfortunately, a double judgment with how I lead any church that I pastor. I, biblically, that is just the way that it goes. And so even in conversations that I've had with people on planes that are not Christians, that get to know who I am, find out I'm a pastor and professor, and we think about it. One of the things that I've said is, is, look, even going back to the road decision, you know, they said, well, since the, since the pastors and the philosophers can't figure out where life begins, then we should assume that life begins at birth. <laughs> that was the assumption of the decision going back to 1973. And I said, or maybe another way of looking at it is this, and I'm not a legal scholar. If, if we don't know when life begins, wouldn't you want to err on the side of caution? That's a completely different way, I think, of looking at it. So since I'm held to a higher account, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advocate for the life in, in the womb, but I'm going to be very, very mindful given information that is given to me. Uh, about the kind of, of uh, well, honestly, advice that I'm going to come alongside a husband and a wife as they're making what could be very difficult decisions. Well, I, I, I completely appreciate your response. Since technically the question was addressed to me, I thought it, I did think it was appropriate for you to yeah. uh, answer first. And I would just uh, say this uh, to those. If anyone were to come to me with this, I would reiterate what Jeremy said about uh, having a, a completely biblical uh, perspective on this, uh, look at the specific situation. But I would make it very clear, as Jeremy has, I think, that in my opinion, there is an extremely strong biblical case for personhood beginning in utero. Mm -hmm. I, I look at passage after passage that there is human life with personhood in utero. And if anyone came to me in my class maybe with a, a pregnant child or struggling with some decision they'd made in the past, I wouldn't shy away from that truth. At the same time, for the many in the Sunday school classroom that agreed with that view, I would also remind them what Jeremy has said about our biblical moral obligations to really support a decision for life. Because in, in my judgment, it is all too easy for us to tell somebody who is truly in a, a financial or social crisis that she must carry that child and bear that burden and then say, have a nice day, I'm going to lunch. Okay? Right. That is not a morally acceptable response. If we're gonna take the biblical injunction to take care of, of the fatherless, the widow, and the alien, all mentioned a strong biblical theme, then we as a church, we in my class, are gonna be supportive of those who have a heavy burden in, in bringing a child into the world because that's also a moral imperative. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna move on to the next question because somehow I got saddled with that one more than you did, Guy. Uh, so here we go. Can a woman go to jail or get sued if she goes to another state for an abortion? Uh, under current law, no. Kavanaugh's concurring opinion suggests that uh, any restriction like that would likely be unconstitutional. And, um, you know, this isn't the kind of thing that, that the states that uh, are testing the waters are doing. When abortion is, is prohibited, it now in the states typically, um, and it is a state issue, but it typically targets the abortion provider. So, so the criminalization is typically not targeting uh, the woman, the woman, uh, right, who, who's facing the, 
the unwanted pregnancy. It, it's, it's the clinicians, it's the doctors who are typically, uh, now, now, you know, that would be an interesting qu question that the court hasn't resolved. I, you know, it would not be unheard of for some state, right, to, to try to be more restrictive and, and criminalize the, the decision of the woman itself, herself, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that would be a question uh, about whether um, the court would accept that. I think that's a different question, actually, when, when it's, uh, when it's the, the woman herself that's the target. So. Well, and I, and I think that the, the reason that this could get tricky is most abortion, well, I'm, I'm trying to remember, maybe 65% are actually coming through medically induced abortions rather than surgically induced abortions. Now, I may be, I may be wrong about that, but I, but I think I'm right, which is basically where a woman is actually getting pills to terminate the pregnancy. And now you've got, well, what if you have that mailed from California to Tennessee, which was mm -hmm. the Tennessee concern, uh, the concern for the state of Tennessee. I think there's more to come. I is, think ba the, is basically, yeah. this is only yeah. the beginning. Yeah, I think you're right. Beginning. It's only the beginning, the but beginning. I think those kinds of things are coming up. And I would remind people that, that an ultimate check here is the political process. So if states get, let's just talk, think about realities. If states get too oppressive in, in penalizing uh, a woman herself, too restrictive. Mm -hmm. That could very well backfire in the political process. Um, and so states need to be, um, they need to have the long game in mind here. Yeah, so th there was a question. I think it's really more of a question of clarity if I'm understanding the question correctly. The question is this, so why is abortion considered a right? Okay, well, it's not now, right? Uh, but, but before, but before, yeah. why was it? Um, the the key is that concept of liberty. I, I should explain something to you more on that liberty. So remember the Fourteenth Amendment uh, that says a state shall not deprive a person uh, of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So liberty. Uh, the question arises as to whether that term liberty has substantive content in and of itself under the constitutional text or uh, that's independent of other listed rights in the Constitution um, or whether that simply means if the Constitution guarantees some right, like, like the right to free exercise of religion, right. the right to free speech, okay, that that right cannot be deprived without uh, due process. There's a question as to what that means. Does liberty have a substantive right in of, of itself that is guaranteed by the con uh, Constitution without regard to other specifically listed rights? Or does the due process clause, as Justice Thomas seems to think, right? Uh, you can read about that in his concurring opinion, that it doesn't guarantee any substance at all. Okay, that you have to look elsewhere for the substance of the right, like the right to free speech in the First Amendment and so forth. And all it says is, you know, there's some kind of process that's required, due process, before that can be deprived uh, a person. So it really, uh, now, now, now Roe was a little more, uh, was a little looser uh, with that right to privacy in the prior decisions that, 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 um, thought there was this right to privacy that wasn't, wasn't specifically listed in the Constitution, separate issue. Now, after Casey, it, it's really grounded in that, that notion of liberty under the 14th Amendment, or if you can't look there, can you look to some other precedent that is, has that is said that, well, in, in, in our concept of ordered liberty, in our history, in tradition, do we think this right is fundamental? That's where the right has to come from, according to the majority opinion. It's got to come either explicitly somewhere in the Constitution, or it has to, under our history and tradition, be grounded in our concept uh, of ordered liberty and, and, and be deemed to be just so fundamental that we recognize the right as a constitutional right. That's, that's, so, so the question is, is abortion that or not, okay? Fundamental. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, now for the dissenters, you've got to take it as a fundamental right. So, uh, Bayer, Kagan, Sotomayor, um, they, wrap, they wrap that up, you know, 50 years of tradition. It's, it's what's necessary to give women 
uh, true access to the marketplace, to make, to socially empower them. That's the way they view it. They, they tie it to um, a woman's right to be a full, equal citizen. Okay, that's the language of the dissent. So if you want to know why they think that right should be recognized, it's not just because Roe said so. It's because in the grand sweep of 50 years of history, uh, that's really what's necessary for w women to be full, equal citizens. Interestingly, given the kinds of language discussions that we're having in political headlines these days, it's all woman, 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 woman about the woman's right to choose uh, in, in the in the dissent. There's, uh, you know, some of the controversy that you've heard about, uh, well, um, can a man get pregnant or something? You don't see any of that uh, in, in the decision. In the decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, in the interest of time, we have one last question. If a decision from 1973 is overturned, are all subsequent decisions based on that case also overturned? Um, I think the answer is no, but I think that there is a fear. Uh, among uh, more of the, the uh, population of legal scholars that think like the dissents, so those that would be typically aligned with what, what are thought of as more liberal constitutional scholars, I think that there is a fear that many of the court's decisions that relied on the same kind of thinking of Roe v. Wade are in, in jeopardy. So uh, I'll give you some examples. Not too long ago was the case of Obergefell. Uh, the case written by Justice Kennedy, the opinion written by Kennedy that recognized a constitutional right to same-sex marriage, right? Um, they're questioning if, if Roe can be overturned because the abortion right is not rooted in our nation's history and tradition, okay? Well, what about Obergefell, the Obergefell decision? Uh, now, what the majority's opinion tried to do was say, we keep telling you abortion is different because there is life or a potential life involved here, right. and the state has a key interest in that. So we're not talking about cases where somebody's life is not at stake. That, that's what the dis dissent said, and, and, and actually uh, at least one of the concurring opinions, I think mm -hmm. it was Kavanaugh, said. Um, but Justice Thomas was in the next door room saying we need to reevaluate everything. Right. Now he's not saying that if the right isn't in the 14th Amendment as, as rooted in nation's history and tradition that that necessarily means the right does not exist. He's not saying that, he didn't go that far. He said we're gonna have to look elsewhere. If, once we recognize that there is no substantive due process, that liberty does not have substantive context, under the 14th Amendment, you have to look elsewhere. What Thomas is saying is, so we can look elsewhere then, right? right? But if you're happy with the outcomes of these other cases, you don't want to look elsewhere, right? right. You want to say, let's just keep on yeah, going with what moving. we've got, right? Yeah. So that, that's, that, that it's true that those issues will have to be fleshed out in, in, in the future. I, I don't think anybody can, can decisively at this point uh, determine where they were. The hint, I think, I think the hint is that most of those decisions, the results in most of those decisions will still hold, um, but the reasoning behind supporting them will likely change. That, that would be my crystal ball projection. All right. All right, my friends. The hour is up. You had some good questions. Hopefully tonight was helpful. Was it at least a little bit? I want to give a thanks to Johnny Buckles for giving his time and expertise to us tonight. And thanks to Jeremy for handling the, the toughest question. Yeah, thanks for punting that one back to me. Really appreciated that. Uh, but I do hope that tonight was helpful to you. Uh, there is certainly a lot to consider and more than, than you would ever cover in an hour. But we at least wanted to get the ball rolling. What was this about? What wasn't it about? And uh, I think we at least did that tonight. So mission accomplished. Hey, it was good to see all of you. Hope that you have an awesome week.